Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Biblical Genetics. I am Dr. Rob coming to you today from my home studio. I am wrapping up a four-part video series called Species Were Designed to Change. This is paralleling a three-part article series that I publish on creation.com, Species Were Designed to Change. If you want to read those articles or learn more about what I'm talking about, just go to creation.com, type in species, change, and maybe add Carter to it or something like that. Hit enter in the search box and these articles will come right up. I have already dealt with how God created or what he created and how he created it to adapt and diversify and adjust over time. We talked about in the second uh, article or the second video how speciation happens and the limits to the amount of change that can happen in a created organism. Then last time I talked about classifying baromens. I know that's kind of a nerdy kind of big words, but classification is always really interesting for the biologists like me because we like to group things and figure out who's related to whom and how similar things are to each other. It's just kind of nerdy, fun stuff. But a baromen is a, a created word. It actually comes from two Hebrew words, bara, to create, and min, a type or kind. So a baromen is one of the created kinds that we read about in the book of Genesis, where it says multiple times God created this group of organisms to reproduce within themselves only. That is a created kind. Okay, for this fourth part of the video series, I want to introduce you to something I'm calling the braided baromen concept. This is one of the coolest things I've ever thought of. This is one of the most fascinating ideas. And it's the idea that species are ephemeral. Species come, species go. Animals can morph in one direction and then re-merge back into the parent population again, and the species can disappear. Now, follow me here as I explain this, but I think this is gonna be really, really, really interesting. Now, those of you who are listening to this on the podcast will have no idea what I'm talking about for a moment, but those of you who have seen any of my videos where I have shot from my home studio, without even realizing it, you were looking at a three-volume set called Corals of the World by the famous coral reef scientist, J.E.N. Varone. Um, this is just a compendium of all the different coral species and how amazing they are, color photographs. I mean, I love that book series. But what I'm talking about in the braided Behrman concept came from another book published by Varone uh, back, I don't know, 20 or more years ago. It was called Corals in Space and Time. And he brought out some very interesting things in the coral world. He said things like, you can very easily pick up a coral, a fossil or a, a dead coral skeleton, or look at a coral out in the wild. And you can say, you know what? I know what family that belongs to. I, you probably know what genus that belongs to, but the species, yeah, that's very often hard to judge. And if you look at the species in one place versus a species on another reef or, or in a different country, maybe a couple thousand miles away, it won't quite look the same. And there's some places where several different species in the same genus or in the same family are pretty easy to recognize, but you go somewhere else and, well, it's not quite as easy someplace else. And sometimes you can go down a reef depth-wise, go down, you know, 10 meters, 100 meters, same species, but they kind of look different. And a species growing in a wave-swept area might tend to be flat, but in the depths it might have plates and, or branches or something, and they can morph with the environment. So the classification of corals is really, really hard. Fun, but hard. And on the cover of his book, he has a picture of a group of species that starts out with four different stalks, and the stalks they grow, they split, they merge, they cross, they merge, they split again, and it's this braided picture. Now, I've been thinking about this literally for over two decades, and I'm finally writing it down and finally speaking about it because this is one of the most uh, important ideas for the creation community. Species are not fixed. The baromen is fixed. Individuals can morph either physiologically or morphologically, or over time, species can adjust and change. This is part and parcel of the creationist world. But in this idea that Varone gave us, 
he introduced a, another word called reticulation. Uh, what does that even mean, reticulate? Well, in, a biologist might talk about reticulation on a beetle. It just means a ladder-like pattern. Stripes, ladders, these are reticulations. And reticulation for him was the idea that if you list a species over time, they'll form a ladder-like pattern as they merge and split and merge again. So we have reticulation, we have the braided barrowman concept, and now let's picture this in our mind. I want you to picture a piece of paper lying on a table. Now, if you were to draw that, and you're not staring directly down on it, you're looking at it from the side, it's in front of you on a table. You couldn't draw a square or a rectangle, you'd have to draw sort of like a, a parallelogram or some attempt at a, a three-dimensional representation. Imagine that piece of paper. Now draw a circle on that piece of paper, right in the middle of it. That represents a barrowman. Now if that was humans, humans I called uh, a type 1 barrowman because it's the only barrowman that we know of where God created two organisms, Adam and Eve. That's it. That's how humans started. We're not told about any other barrowman in that way. So uh, I imagine he created billions upon billions of E. coli, millions of oak trees, lots and lots of earthworms, tons of beetles. Fine, but he only created two people. We have to get out of the thought. When we're thinking of, of creation, the Garden of Eden, we, we tend to think of bears and lions and, you know, complex land vertebrates that we're familiar with. We kind of forget about leeches and snails and uh, octopuses and things like that. Even though most of the diversity of life is not on land. And when Adam went around naming the animals, he only m named a small fraction of all the animals. And he didn't necessarily say, oh, look at those two toucans. I'm going to call one Sam and one Samantha. I mean, no, there's probably toucans all over the world or at least spread out in different places around the world, not just two individuals. And what that does is that gives us the ability to imagine a lot more diversity in that initial created kind than most people think. So going back to this piece of paper on the table, you have a circle. That circle represents your created kind. A big circle might represent lots of genetic diversity. A large circle might represent a lot of individuals. It can represent anything you want. Now the X and Y axis, maybe uh, the Y axis is uh, size, tall to short, maybe the, the other axis is green to yellow. Or you could throw genetics in there, different uh, genes, you could throw in behavior in there. It doesn't really matter, it's just some theoretical, philosophical uh, depiction of your barrowman. Now, here's where it gets cool. Raise a piece of paper up off the table. Raise it maybe a foot off the table. Now, height is going to represent time. And as that barrowman adjusts to new environments, meets new competitors, natural selection, mutation, all these things that come into play to, to change this barrowman, that circle is not going to remain in the same place or the same shape or remain the same size. It might grow. It might split into two different species. It might move across your page as maybe the individuals start getting larger or maybe changing color or behavior. You don't have a fixed thing. It's, it's shifting and ebbing and flowing across your page. Now, if the vertical axis, you're lifting that piece of paper up represents time, that piece of paper is a slice through time. And we have three time periods where we have very interesting things. One is at creation. The second major time period we're concerned with is the flood where we have so many different organisms dead and buried in rocks. That is actually a snapshot of time where we're looking at the barominic diversity of all sorts of different organisms that are captured in the rocks. And then maybe three feet off the table, four feet off the table, how, depending on what your time axis is, we have today. And if we look at today and that circle, that circle might have split at the whole bunch of different circles. Maybe that represents all the species of cats. Oh, interestingly though, the, all those cats today came from two cats around the ark. So we had some unknown number of cats in the beginning as a paper is lying on the table. And then over time, they're doing their thing and at the flood, two of those cats only, from however much diversity was in, the, in those cats before that, get on the ark. Those two cats come off the ark, they start reproducing and they, they split and split and split 
to today. But they also merged a few times because we know in cat genetics there's evidence of hybridization. In fact, in dogs, I just read a, a paper just this week, the yellow coat color in yellowish dogs is not very similar to the coat color gene in gray wolves. Gray wolves is the parent species for modern dogs. But the yellow coat color gene for dogs is more similar to the white coat of arctic wolves, not gray wolves. What this means is that there's a lot of hybridization diversity initially and genes floating around in the population that's splitting over time. And so your circle of two dogs at the flood has become multiple circles on your piece of paper. In my last episode and in part three of this article series, I described four different types of barriers. So type one is humans because we started with only two. And if you draw your humans on a piece of paper and you start raising it up, it'll grow to some unknown size. And then only eight people survive. And then those eight people are gonna become all the people in the world today, seven and a half billion people, plus Neanderthals, plus Denisovans, plus some maybe extinct archaic uh, groups that we're only getting hints of in our genetics. So that circle is gonna splinter. But then as we get more and more and more people, well, people are people and they're gonna merge back together again because that's what happens when people meet each other, they spread their genes around amongst each other, you know. Imagine a type 2 bearman. This is a bearman that I'm saying has um, not much genetic diversity, but there might be a lot of them. So you could have a large circle, but because there's not a lot of genetic diversity, there's not a lot of opportunity for speciation. And so at the flood, if, if it's a clean group, you might have seven or seven pairs. If it's an unclean group of animals, you only have two. There's not going to be a lot of speciation after the flood either. There's some possibility, but not a lot. The type 3 barrowman to me is the most interesting because that's a group of organisms God created with a lot of diversity. Now, if you only started with a few organisms, you can still get change over time. Great. But if you, he started with lots of organisms in discrete pockets, ooh, that's the interesting thing because that means that as these organisms grow independently in little subpopulations, Eventually, if one of the organisms makes it to another population, you get a mixing of genes. You might get an explosion of speciation. You may get a lot of change really quickly because of that interchange of genetics. You don't need evolution for any of this. You just need God-created diversity playing out over time. Now, the fourth Bearman was um, um, a asexual organisms, organisms that only produce copies of themselves. This is interesting. There are not many of them in the world. I mean, not even bacteria are asexual. Bacteria exchange genes with other species of bacteria and with other bacteria within their species all the time. So even bacteria aren't purely asexual, but there are a few asexual organisms out there. And essentially each organism is its own baromen because it can't exchange genes with any other organism. There is some limited speciation potential here because you can get mutations and the mutations can affect um, that organism, but really each, uh, each asexual organism is its own single group. That, that's really cool. But look what I'm doing here. I'm claiming there is change over time in the creationist model. Potentially, there's lots of create, uh, change over time, depending on how much created diversity God put into those barriers. But I'm also taking all the evidence of change over time that, that Charles Darwin used and saying, no, Mr. Darwin, that's evidence for creation. That's a biblical idea. This is not God created all things just as they are today. That's nonsense. No, our brilliant, genius, engineering, creative God put into his creation the ability to change and adapt over time. Now, very importantly, evolution claims change over time. Now I'm saying creation claims change over time. If both theories are claiming the same thing, then that evidence is not evidence of either theory. I introduced this in a, um, an article I wrote several years ago called How to Think, Not What to Think. And basically what I said was you can have um, one theory that claims a bunch of stuff. And every time people tend to say, every time I find information that, that supports my theory, it disproves my other theory. But that's not how theories work because theories are trying to explain the same data set. And if they can both explain the same things, that area of overlap is not evidence for either theory. It's consistent with both theories. 
So change over time is not proof of evolution. It's not even good evidence for evolution because you need a certain type of change. You need information increases. You need complexity increases. You need the purging of bad change. You can't have change that goes downhill, which is what something we see all the time in biology. You have to have change that goes uphill. And that is a foreign concept to the natural world of biology. Once you have an information set, you can modify it. Yes, you can. You can mutate it. You can rearrange it. You can duplicate it, whatever. But just because we see changes in this information set that we see in living organisms that doesn't prove evolution, what it does is tell us that our God is brilliant. So there you have it. My four-part series, Species Were Designed to Change. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, I do hope you'll go and visit my Biblical Genetics website, biblicalgenetics.com. You can also find me on Parler and Gab and MeWe. I have a little footprint there, but my main footprint is on Facebook on my Biblical Genetics group. You can go find it. It's a publicly seeable, but you can't see anything posted there unless you're a member. But you can apply for membership or get someone to invite you. You can get in that way also. But as always, before I leave, I need to thank my supporters. I have several new supporters on Buy Me A Coffee this month. That's a... Uh, buymeacoffee.com is a little place where you can just leave a tip for a presenter. It's, you know, three, six, or nine dollars, or however much you like. It's just a nice little, hey, Mr. Carter, thank you very much. Here's, here's a, a little bit. Go buy yourself a coffee. But uh, this month, I've had two anonymous donors. Uh, Stephanie S., you stepped up once again, uh, very consistently. I really appreciate all your help here. Brian M., George S., uh, uh, two new people, John H., and at RS2. Thank you, guys and girls. Love you. I really appreciate your support. But over on Patreon.com, most content providers on, on YouTube and a lot of uh, podcasters, um, they use Patreon as a source of, um, of support. This is a monthly donors, people who are really ponying up, really stepping aside and partnering with me to help get this program going and keep it going. So um, my top level of Patreon, Dave H, Adam B, M. Matsky, and Rob S. You guys have been with me from the beginning, most of you. Thank you so much. The middle level, Mark K, Mike from Australia, Daniel P, James R, and Jeff V D. Thank you. I know most of these people personally, not all of them though. Some people are brand new to me and I don't know you from Adam, but for my friends, thank you. For my new friends, thank you also. On the lower level on Patreon, Jonathan P., Paul P., and Ted H. Thank you. You guys are really helping me, uh, encouraging me, motivating me to keep on going. This is actually not easy. This is the third time I've, I've this is the third time I have recorded this episode. I've had all sorts of lighting problems. Um, just because, you know what? I'm not a filmmaker. I am a biologist who's trying to make films, and it's not easy, but it sure is a lot of fun. And the comments that I'm getting, the people that I'm meeting, I'm loving this a lot. I'm about to go off on my second trip post-COVID for Creation Ministries International as a speaker. I'm actually going to Northwest Iowa. This is going to be really interesting for me because that's Ice Age country. I'm going to see the Los Hills of Western Iowa. I'm not going to get to the glaciated areas. It's about an hour east of where I'll be, and I'm not going to have time to get there. But I've seen a lot of glaciated areas. I love traveling. I love meeting people. I love seeing cool things. And I love taking what I see and trying to put it into a biblical context. Context. I believe on my next episode, I'm going to be talking about is COVID-19 evolving? That is a hot topic, a hot button topic. I'm going to make some people mad. I'm trying to avoid most discussions on COVID-19. I haven't actually done anything on COVID-19 in quite a while on biblical genetics because there's so much angst and so much misinformation out there that I just want to leave it. But this is a question I keep on getting asked. Is the virus evolving? Does mutation equal evolution? And how do we explain the rise of newer, more infectious, potentially more deadless ver deadly versions like uh, Delta and Lambda? Stay tuned. That's coming up. Uh, probably the next episode of Biblical Genetics.